Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining another episode of the Educational Leadership Podcast, where we're interviewing leaders in public education from around the great state of Texas. We have another very special guest, and we also have our co-host, Corinne French. Hey, thanks for having us today, Gary, and I'm so excited to meet our guest today. Yes, yeah, same here. Dr. Hark Ryder from Sup Superintendent of Willis ISD. Dr. Hark Ryder, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Corinne. Appreciate the time. Absolutely. And before before we jump into the, the conversation, because I'm, I'm really excited about this conversation, by the way, and you're going to you're going to hear what this is all about here in a second. But before we before we get into that, Dr. Harkwriter, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, this is my uh, 21st year in public education. Uh, number nine is superintendent here at Willis ISD. I worked my way up the ranks. I was a teacher coach for six years. I uh, high school assistant principal for two years, and then I uh, really kind of took a uh, quick road up. I was an elementary principal for a year, a middle school principal for two years, a high school principal for a year, and, and got the privilege of sitting in the superintendent seat here at Willis. So a uh, quick climb up the ranks, just very blessed to work with a lot of great leaders that I think uh, prepared me and honestly took some chances on me without a lot of experience. And um, I love what I'm doing to impact kids and, and our staff each and every day. Hey, before Gary asks the question, I'm gonna I'm gonna pop in with one. You just gave us a great like summary of how you became superintendent. I have to know, did you know that you wanted to be a superintendent early on? And then I'm gonna have a secondary question. What would be your tips for those people who are wanting to ascend to superintendent? The superintendent. Got you. Okay. Uh, number one, absolutely no. I had no <laughs> intentions on being a superintendent. I was an All American baseball player at the University of Texas, played uh, professional baseball with the Angels, and that was what I thought my life's goal was was to be a professional baseball player. Uh, I had the privilege of paying for five years. I had an injury that cut my career short, and then it was you know, what do I do next? Both, both of my parents were in public education mm -hmm. and uh, still love the, the athletic piece and the competition. So went back to school, uh, finished, got into the teaching coaching side. And, and my dad was kind of pushing me to get into school administration. And when I started, I had no idea that I would ever be sitting in this seat. Mm -hmm. Well, before we get into the questions here, Dr. Harkrider, I have to know, you being a baseball star and all, do you ever go out there on the baseball field and hit, hit some balls with the team? Or You know, I, I get that a lot, and, and no, I, I do not. You know, I, I know my age now. I, my competition years are over. I do try to go out and watch the guys. Our baseball coach right now is wanting me to come out and work with the middle infielders. I told him I'm not quite as young as I used to be. He said, yeah, but I think you still got it. So I think at one point I'm going to get out there and work with our guys. Uh, you know, I just try to be there just to support them. And, you know, sometimes when you've got a lot of experience in an area and you get a lot of questions that second guess our coaching staffs and stuff. So I kind of try to keep my distance and, and support our coaches. And, you know, none of us are perfect. And, you know, we do our best job we can with our kids. But I have not swung a bat in a long time. I've dropped the bat for a golf club. And so I, I think I swung a baseball bat better than I do a golf club, but I'm still working on it. <laughs> that's awesome. That, that's such a that's such a cool resource, you know, for lack of better words, of having somebody within the district that used to be a professional baseball player to go out there on the field and just be able to provide some pointers. Or, I mean, I'm sure I'm sure there's a lot of teams that would love to have a professional ball player come out and provide some kind of clinic or something. But your district has it. <laughs> Right, right, right there. <laughs> I, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think some of the kids look at me like, did you really used to play? And I'm like, Google still has me in there. So you're good. I, I did. It was many years ago, but I enjoy talking to the kids. I love watching kids compete. I think uh, life mirrors athletics from a standpoint of the competition. Uh, you're not always going to win in life. Uh, you know, can you get back up after you lose? Do you work harder? The work ethic piece of it. Uh, firm believer you get in what you put out of something and if you go at it hard each and every day and you know if it doesn't work out there's no regrets you put everything that you had in it you just weren't successful at that point in time got it got it and it makes perfect sense so so let's your background your experience public education right and we were talking a little bit about before before the podcast even started we were talking about how 
sports is connected to public education to a certain degree. And I, I really liked how you were, you were talking about that because it kind of, I don't know, for me, it, it got those, uh, that competitive mindset flowing and that, you know, that desire to, to exceed the potential that you think, I mean, you just think of a sports team, you're always getting better. You're always, you're working hard, you're getting better, you're, you're having fun. There's a lot of things that go into that. Well, so tell me a little bit about what, what that looks like in your mind, sports and public education. Yeah, I think from the, the first right off the bat, you know, life's not fair. And, uh, you know, regardless of what circumstances you're coming through, whether you have two parents at home that work and finances aren't, aren't an issue, whether you are from a, a one parent household uh, where income is, is struggling, uh, life is, is not fair. We're always going to have things thrown at us. But what we do all control is, is our work ethic. And as far as the adults go in the school business is, is we have to work to grow kids, not only academically, but really the whole child. You know, how do we prepare them to be successful for life? And, you know, when we talk to, you know, kinder teachers, first grade teachers say, you know, your job is to prepare them, obviously, for whatever the curriculum is in, in kinder, first, fourth grade, whatever. But you're also setting them up to be successful in life because at each step of their development, if we're giving the kids what they need at each step, we're setting them up to be successful. And it's OK to let kids fail. I think as, as parents nowadays, it's a lot different than when I grew up. You know, when, when I failed, mom and dad, everybody didn't get a trophy. Everybody didn't get a ribbon. That's life. What did you not do successful? How are you going to make it better? And you work to change that cycle. And I think too many times now we struggle with we don't want kids to fail. And when kids struggle academically, we think, well, there's something has got to be wrong with them. Learning's hard. You know, not everybody learns at the same pace. And just because a student struggles to learn, it doesn't mean that they necessarily have a disability. What supports do we need to put into place, just like we do on a baseball field or on an athletic competition field, the practice piece takes care of the game piece. So what are we doing on a day-to-day -day basis to prepare kids academically? And, you know, a lot of times they may not love a particular subject area. So how do we get them out of that funk? You know, kids grow up, they think science hard, math hard. So automatically they don't like science or math because they've heard over the years it's hard so how do we motivate them how do we connect why they need this math knowledge or science knowledge in the real world and I think kids today more than ever need to have that connection between life and what we're asking them to do in the classroom and I think they see it they have access to everything in the world on their cell phone and they all have one. And so we've got to make sure that we keep pace with the speed and energy that kids can learn at in today's times. Wow. I mean, you, you, you said a lot there. And I want, I want to touch on a couple of things that you mentioned. Um, and a little background on me. I, I left the corporate world you know, over a year ago and joined a faith-based organization focused on giving back, giving money, giving funds to schools and churches, right? And um, I'm passionate about that. And through that process, I've gotten to know different school districts and, and education. I'm, I'm a big advocate of education. If you look at, you know, the colleges I've gone to, it's, you know, probably, you know, if you ask my wife, she probably says you spent too much on education, but <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of that. And, but you're, you're right, because I, I feel like looking back when I went to school and Corinne, you may be able to say the same thing. You're given a lot of different subjects that you learn and then you get to the end of the road and it's like all right figure it out you know you, you learn math you learn science history how's that all going to come together to make you know my dreams come true and right. so, so I, I like what you're saying about piecing it all piecing it all together and then also on the, the failure mm -hmm. and especially students that try really hard to make good grades and then they get out and realize that it doesn't matter how good a grade you've made, you're still going to fail at some point. And it's so hard to get back up again and keep going and, and deal with that failure. If you're used to, to that, that kind of uh, reward system, in my mind, um, Corinne, any thoughts on that? Well, yeah. I mean, so I, I, I'm laughing because I have five boys and I feel like I've had to sit through more football games than any grown woman ever should have to sit through. And I still don't understand football. Baseball is about the only sport that I can kind of understand. It's because I played softball in high school, but well, not like officially, you know, just kind of there. But I, I think the idea of uh, the idea of failing, that's probably one of the best to me as a mom and as an educator, 
and just as a human, I think sports is probably one of the best um, indicators of how you can handle life later because you have to be able to be part of something bigger than you mm -hmm. and you have to be able to experience failure together. Like you have to see like, okay, we, we literally failed. Can we do anything differently? And sometimes there's nothing you can do differently. Someone's just better. Right. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of that, like, and how things are happening right now in public ed. And I think kids are afraid of failure. Yeah. And that, that kind of worries me. Um, I fail at things all the time. Right. Yeah, we really, people, people think now that, that failing is a, uh, it's a moment in time. Mm -hmm. It's not a definition of who you are. And, and I think society really has put such a negative connotation on any sort of failure that mm -hmm. if when kids or adults experience the failure, they think that's who they are. It's right. a moment in time. You know, it's just this one glimpse of something that didn't work out and, and you keep fighting. But I think the connotation in today's world, any sort of failure is, is just miserable. It's terrible. How dare you where there's no learning without failure. And we tell our teachers that all the time, a student learning, you know, if, if they already knew everything, it really wouldn't be too difficult to teach them. Part of learning is you fail, you know, you fail an exam, but then we come back, we reteach, you understand where you missed and, and comprehend the mistakes you made, and then you move forward and you're more successful the next time. But, you know, getting away from, from that cape of failure that is with me all the time, no, it's, it's very short-lived. You know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm concerned. I, we, 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 it's a short podcast. We don't have, we might have to have you on again to talk about this, but I'm kind of, I'm very concerned right now that, that teachers, um, I, well, let me back up this we're for anyone who listens, we were experiencing a global pandemic right now. And when teachers were sent home and students were sent home, I think we had this opportunity to, to say, oh my gosh, teachers are amazing. They do great work. Right. And we got to see that. So anyone who maybe didn't believe that teachers were amazing got to see that. And now this actually seems like a harder year than that first year. Right. What kind of encouragement do you have to offer those teachers who are potentially wanting to leave the field? I work in higher ed and we're short staffed also, you know, staffed also, but when I get to spend time in a district, I got to spend time in a local district last week and I'm looking at these students and I'm seeing them, some of them kind of that checked out look, but then after they come up to you and talk to you. So you can't judge what you're seeing sometimes because the light bulb might be going off and they're just not verbally, they're not, not visually giving you that. Right. You know. So what kind of encouragement do you have for those of us who are in public ed, those of us who might, we, we know some of our colleagues are wanting to, to do other things. Um, and then like I mentioned earlier, like those who maybe should think of administration, maybe maybe leaving the teaching field, but ascending to superintendent or other roles in administration is the time. So do you have some encouragement and some tips for them? Yeah, you know, I, I really thought when we switched and we were able to offer the online aspect that it was really a chance for us to transform public education in Texas to offer mm -hmm. multiple platforms because sitting in a seat, coming to high school every day in a large high school, you know, from a social standpoint, social emotional standpoint may not be the best environment for certain kids, but, you know, having a teacher on the other side of Zoom or whatever and being able to still instruct them, it doesn't take away the quality of instruction necessarily. And I think we've just been stuck here once we, we did it. And I think in, in our category, we got better as we went on with the online learning piece and had an opportunity to jump in this year and really ramp it up even more. With that option being taken away from us, we're back into that one size fits small education model that quite honestly doesn't work in today's times. It doesn't right. work because of technology. It doesn't work from what all the kids have a chance to be exposed to. And I think in the end, we get back and we've all lived through the pandemic. It's, it's been rough on all of us. And I think we forget there were challenges before the pandemic. You know, we weren't all walking around and, and singing Kumbaya and everything was great every month. We, we still had challenges. The difference is we have the same challenges on top of uh, the pandemic and how it's affecting our families, our friends. You know, we all have a loved one that some form or fashion has been impacted in a negative way. And I feel like a lot of us and a lot of our staff feels like the weight of the world really is on them and, and they don't see an end because we got through it last year 
here and hey, we got rock and roll in this fall. And then all of a sudden, here's another strand of the virus. It's like, when is this cycle ever going to end? And, and I think just what you said, when you go in classrooms, when you see what teachers are doing, uh, I leave motivated. And, and as a district, you know, we've given retention bonuses two years in a row. We're still trying to show our staff COVID leave days, everything we can to know we're in this together. We understand your pain. The rub and the difficulty for us is I still can't make their job any different. We still have standards we have to teach kids. There is a expectation of the success level of our students and, and the state's not going to lower that. So our job is to continue to raise the bar and to provide the support to our staff that, you know, as best we can to know, hey, we love you. We're in this thing together and let's do what we can to make our kids be successful. Mm. Yeah. Thank Dr. You. Hark Harkrider, you, you mentioned something there that y'all were ramping up online learning and then it, it was what did the state take it away where y'all couldn't do that anymore or? yeah the state had come back and, and they were looking at options and, and that's a very difficult decision on their part as well too mm -hmm. is, is how do you handle the online learning you know do you have one model and and i think just them trying to figure out how they were going to make that work uh it was it was just a lot and over the course of the summer i think we got into a cycle where we felt like hey we're past this we're good we don't need that aspect uh, but I just think we're in an environment now there there's been online high schools now for years. Uh, you can get online degrees, master's degrees, doctoral degrees online. You never go face to face. I think we're really missing an opportunity to showcase the great educators that we have, uh, regardless of the teaching platform we're using. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping and I know part of that is attendance and, and how do we do it? The state's decision is not an easy process either, but I think, and I don't think I know, we have some amazing school districts from the smallest to the largest that do great things. If we could be given a little bit more autonomy of how we want to handle that platform for our community with our taxpayers, because you're going to have some communities that, you know, they're not going to want to offer the online piece. They want their kids to come in person, but the larger that district gets, the dynamics change. And you're going to have, you know, at some larger districts, you may have four or 5,000 kids that want that online platform or parents want that online platform. Because the bottom line is this, if that's what they want, if we can't give it to them, they're going to go get it through another option. Right. And we feel like and I feel like there's some great educational programs out there, but I don't think anything beats what we offer here in Texas and public education platform. And if we could have a little bit more autonomy to be able to instruct kids the way our community sees that we should, uh, I think it wouldn't do anything but but help us improve. I completely agree. I mean, it was an interesting environment getting thrown into that online learning. I mean, you had, it was in, in the middle of a pandemic and so obviously I believe that that played a factor in, in thing. I mean, there's really no time to prepare. It was from, you know, A to Z in a matter of days. It really, it really was. And I think that was the disappointing fact about us that we felt like we were getting better that, you know, we were ramped up for the summer of how we were going to really, you know, figure out how many kids wanted to do it, what that was going to look like, the training for teachers, what platforms we wanted to offer, that we really were starting to get a handle on it. Because you were right, we had to pretty much invent it overnight. Mm -hmm. Over the course of, honestly, seven days, we had to jump into that platform. And, uh, you know, we had some teachers that loved it. They were really good at it. You know, we have other teachers that didn't want that platform. They want the kids right in front of them. And, and I think that's the cool thing about having the options. Everybody can find their niche to help kids be successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody learns differently. And I, I like the inno innovative mindset that that I'm getting, you know, I know this is our first conversation here, but I, I'm really getting the impression that Willis ISD is an innovative school district, not only from the mindset around curriculum, I, I you know, of course, I love the sports and the public education, you know, it's a, it's serious, but it's a game and you adapt and, you know, failing forward, failing fast. And I mean, there's a lot of really great topics. And of course, from the technology standpoint, I think it's an it's inevitable at some point in the future that if you're not online, you're not doing online learning, you're you're missing the boat from a performance standpoint because everybody learns differently. Um, before we close out, uh, Corinne, anything you'd like to ask, Dr. Harkrider? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think just I keep going back to that one question of just encouraging those teachers that might want to go to become a superintendent. I'm working on my doctorate right now. And awesome. uh, originally my, re my research was going to be uh, female, female superintendents and their role and how they, you know, how they perceive the role and that um, I'm end up going to do it on my dissertation on 
um, female board members, but what what kind of advice do you have for those teachers right now that are thinking about leadership? Um, no, I, I think it's awesome. I think, uh, you know, it's it's a as we're struggling to find teachers to fill seats, I think, I know at my level, we're struggling to find uh, administrators as well. And, and there's not a better lens to sit in an administrative seat. Uh, than a person that's been in the classroom. And, you know, you you can always go back and teach if you decide, you, you know, you don't like it. But, uh, you know, I, I think the, the biggest thing is, you know, you, you have to be comfortable. Number one, the organization is the number one key in being an effective communicator for any for any uh, administrator. But I think understanding there, there's controversy that comes with the job. And, and from my standpoint, I wanted to make a, a, a larger difference. You know, as a teacher and a coach, I had X amount of kids in the classroom. Right. And, you know, 45 mm -hmm. or 50 kids on my baseball program. And then as a, a, uh, a assistant principal, I could impact, you know, the six or 700 kids that were in my alphabet. And then as a elementary principal, 750 kids, you know, 40 staff members, then it came up to 900 kids. So each platform that I've had was an opportunity to impact a, a broader audience. And that was really my motivation as I moved up through the ranks. What, well, how can I have a larger impact? And I think each step is important because it gives you the lens that you need to move on to the next level. And as, as folks are trying to move up that ladder, I think patience uh, is a good thing to have. We have some great administrators and they're in a row one or two years and they're like, boom, let me, let me go to the next one. And it's funny, I laugh when I'm giving advice of slow down, but I didn't, but I also wasn't the one moving me up. My, you know, my boss says, hey, I want you to take on this job. So I think that balance but I think that the biggest motivation has to be your impact on a larger audience. And, and that's a goal and something you want to do. If it's just, I want to be administrator, what's the drive behind that? Because mm -hmm. the drive behind that's what's going to get you through the rough days. If you just <laughs> want to be an administrator, you know, a few days mm -hmm. into it, you may be like, you know what? No, because you may go several days and there's not a good one. That's just, it's part of it because everything we deal with seems to be negative. And, and I still get my motivation back if it's a rough day. I've never walked through an elementary campus that I don't leave with a smile. Right. Not that I don't with middle and high school, but it's just something about the little ones running up and giving you a hug uh, that you know why you're still doing what you do. Mm, that's beautiful. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Outstanding. This has been such an exciting podcast talking about mindset, technology, I mean, in a very, in a very prescriptive way, right? Innovation. So those of, that, those of you that have been tuning in, educators out there, hopefully you've learned a lot from today's podcast. And before we close out, just want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Ideal Impact. I mentioned earlier, faith-based organization. I'm a part of that organization. Ideal Impact gives funding to schools and churches. So far, they've given $1.5 billion dollars to public education and churches, over 160 school districts in Texas. Sweeney ISD gave their teachers salary increases every year since working with IDO Impact. So if your district is looking for funding, unrestricted funds for any initiative, and it's not a grant, it's recurring revenue that's generated with technology. And if you're looking for that revenue, reach out to IDO Impact. And Corinne, Dr. Harkrider, enjoy the podcast. Thanks for coming on, Dr. Harkrider. Absolutely. I appreciate y'all. Very nice to meet you. Thank you for the time. Nice to meet you. And for, for those of y'all been tuning in, tune in for future episodes of the Educational Leadership Podcast.